Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Today on the podcast, my guest is Ronald Donnell. Ron is actively serving as an officer in the U.S. Air Force and is working on a Ph.D. in leadership. Ron and I talk about his three C's of leadership, care, commit, and change lives. This is a powerful view of leadership that you just don't see every day. I'm excited to have him on the show to share this leadership philosophy with all of you. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ronald Donnell. Ron is currently an Air Force officer where he spent the past 17 years. 14 of those years, he was enlisted, and three years ago, he was promoted into the officer ranks. He's currently a first lieutenant. He's also a PhD candidate working on a degree in management with a specialization in leadership. Like me, Ron has a fascination with the topic of leadership. I'm excited to have him on the show today to talk about his unique view of leadership. So, Ron, welcome. Thanks, John. So tell us about your military background, especially how you went, you know, from being enlisted in the Air Force and moving into the officer ranks. Well, so like you said, I've been in uh, just under 17 years, Uh, kind of started out in civil engineering as a structures troop. So that's For those who don't know, uh, structures is kind of like a vertical type of construction work. So we did everything from from the ground up, standing buildings up, uh, doing interior work, doing exterior work, roofing, all that kind of stuff. I kind of chose that career field because I love working with my hands. I Mm -hmm. love designing things. I love building things. Um, But most of all, I love to see the final outcome of things and and see how where it started to where it went. Um, And I think that really translated into my passion for leadership, right? Because mm. you, you develop these relationships with people uh, and that kind of builds and you get to see, a lot of times you get to see the end. Sometimes you don't, you know, especially in the military, you move on, you lose contact with folks. But uh, so I started out in civil engineering, did that for a few years, uh, was stationed at my first duty station for five years, kind of grew through that. Um, and then I got the wonderful opportunity to go out and be a, a technical school instructor. Uh, and mm-hmm. I love that time. I think doing that really developed skills, management skills, uh, and then those kind of translated into leadership skills down the road. Uh, but I'll tell you that the team that I had there was amazing. Uh, it was mm-hmm. the best group of guys that I've ever been around. You know, when we talk about leadership. Uh, you can't walk alone through leadership, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you have to have people around you that sharpen you and, and develop your skills and you help them develop their skills and you, and you do it together. You do leadership together. Right. Mm. And uh, that was really where I learned that concept because those guys were sharp. Um, I spent a few years there uh, and then I moved on, went out to, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with red horse. Um, it's a, it's a different division of CE. Uh, but their primary mission is downrange, right? It's it's building bases downrange or developing training centers in different places. So so their mission set is a little bit different, it's a little a little more high speed. Uh, but we got some great opportunities to lead there. Transitioned into uh, superintendent of Honor Guard, uh, which kind of shows you the opposite spectrum of you know you come in and you're, you're developed as an airman all the way through, uh, and then after you retire, well, what happens, right? Does mm-hmm. the military just completely forget about you? Uh, and so you kind of get to see that side of it, you know, the, the ability to honor people who are retiring and those who have fallen mm-hmm. uh, was a great opportunity to lead uh, a group of guys from all over base. So it wasn't mm-hmm. just CE anymore. It was, it was a vast amount of people, which was great. Um, and that's where I commissioned out of, uh, and I commissioned into uh, what was then the personnel field, which is now for support. Uh, and our, our job is just taking care of people. Mm. So I, I love it. 
Uh, you can talk about force support. There's 10 different squadrons uh, and it's a, they spread across the entire base. So really you don't, you don't do anything on a military installation or an air force installation, at least where force support is not part of it. Okay. All right. So it's food, fitness, lodging, civilian and military personnel, childcare, uh, you know, the, the pier out back, the uh, bowling centers, all of that uh, mm-hmm. falls under force support. So it's, it's just a vast place. Uh, and, yeah, so that's where I'm at now, and I I love every bit of it. So it's mm. been a, a fun journey for sure. Well, and it's and it's unusual, not unusual, but it's 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 not common that someone does 14 years enlisted and then moves into the commissioned rank. So it you know for the folks that I was in the military with, those are kind of special people. They were people that were lifelong learners. They were um, curious. They they were pushing themselves. So how how did you make the transition from enlisted to officer? What what um, you know? I know we've we've talked earlier about uh, you you know your fascination with the leadership, but also education too. You continue to learn and continue to push yourself. So is that was that the you know was that some of the catalyst for you moving into the officer's ranks? Yeah, it was. So uh, you know, as a young airman, I progressed fairly quickly uh, and was given a lot of opportunities to, to lead and to learn. Uh, and as I was going through those, you know, uh, the senior NCOs that were around were, were retiring and they would retire mm-hmm. and they would come back and mm-hmm. they would be doing the same job. Right. But they were, they'd be getting either less pay uh, or less responsibility. And I thought, man, I don't want to do that. I don't mm-hmm. want to spend 20 years in the military and retire and do the same thing that I was doing when I was an airman. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started going to school and mm-hmm. I've, I've kind of fell in love with the, with the passion for learning, mm. uh, and and that developed along the same time frame as my passion for leadership. So, like you said, I just became a lifelong learner uh, at that moment, and in doing so, uh, I started to have more leadership opportunities. And and when that happens, you know, you start to fall in love with what you see happen. Mm. Right? So there were transitions with folks that I was working with and working for uh, that really showed me that. Hey man, there's something in this. Mm. Right? There's something that I can do to affect change in people's lives, and it makes a difference. Mm. Uh, and I, I fell in love with that. So I, I've just continued down that same path for for years now, uh, and that did help me transition because as you as you start to influence people, right, and you fall in love with that, you want to you want to grow that span of influence, mm. right? And uh, I can remember a specific chief, <clears throat> Chief January. I'm not real sure where he is now. I'm sure he's he's long retired and, and doing great things on the civilian side, but uh, but he was our our squadron superintendent, and you know I'm I'm just an E4. We're talking about an E9 E4, and and he was very passionate in his leadership and very uh, personable. Mm-hmm. I remember I played on the squadron basketball team, and he would come out and watch the basketball games. He would come up to me afterwards, and he would say, "Hey, you did great, but here's some things you can work on." Mm, right? so he was always encouraging, and he was always uh, trying to develop folks, uh, and that really that was where I wanted to be. Mm. I wanted to do what he did, right? Um, <clears throat> so that developed my passion for wanting to progress and to, mm. and to get better and to develop skills. Uh, and as I continued to do that, I had a few officers who uh, kind of invested in me. And, and I thought, man, if I'm going down this education path and I want to be a leader and I want to have a bigger span of influence, why not commission? Mm. Um, so that's really how it started. Uh, and, and I just continued down that path and it eventually worked out for me. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stories of failure and, uh, and disappointment along the way, but I think those things just make you stronger. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, build yeah, build your build your characteristics. Uh, your your character as a leader is having to go to go through tough times and failure is a big teaching and a big learning uh learning skill, right? Oh, when yeah, you go through yeah. those failures, you you learn so much from it. So so you when, when you and I talked last time, we talked about you have a motto and it's the three C's of leadership. So I want to talk to you a little bit about those three C's, what they mean and why they're so important for leadership. Yeah. So, you know, I, I can think back uh, to moments when I was you know, a, a young, young kid playing football. Right. And I had coaches that were like, Hey, you want to play quarterback? And I'm like, eh, you know, I don't, I don't know. Do I, mm. do I want to be the leader <laughs> of a team? 
Um, you know, and I, I got thrust into a lot of these positions, right? And at that, that time, it didn't mean anything to me, right? But I can tell you what I learned from those time frames was that leadership is not about the leader, mm. right? It's not about me. And as, as I led early on, you know, uh, through youth football and through high school and even into my military career, um, I didn't realize that. It was about, well, what do I want? I'm the one that's in charge. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I, I understood that leadership is about making a difference, right? It's about changing the lives of other people. Um, and, and, and going along with the fact of being a lifelong learner, right? Leaders are always learners. And you're always learning something new every single day. Um, so I started to, to get curious about it. So I started reading books. Um, I can attest a lot of my leadership knowledge early on to John Maxwell. Mm. Uh, I read a, read a lot of his stuff. Uh, and in the simplest form, he said that leadership is influence, mm. right? And I thought, man, that's great, John. Uh, but how do I do that? How do I influence <laughs> people, right? Uh, so I, I started reading more and, and learning more and, and applying these things. And the, and the bottom line was take care of people, right? So how do you take care of people? Well, you you meet them where they're at. Mm. And then and then you try to figure out how to get them to the next point, right? Mm-hmm. Um but let me say that I also read one of his books called Failing Forward, mm. right? and, it, and it taught me to lead boldly because you're going to fail as a leader. You're going to make mistakes, uh, but it's what you do with those mistakes and how you learn from those mistakes that are going to help you develop, and it's also going to help your uh, followers develop, right? Uh, so as, as you, know, you start thinking about taking care of people and, and meeting them where they're at, uh, it's about developing that dialogue with them, right? And you know, I've heard and seen the definition of dialogue as uh, the art of thinking together, mm. right? So you're, you're getting into their minds and you're learning what it is that drives them and motivates them. Uh, and, and, and you're doing that together, mm. right? And, you know, the Maxwell also has another saying, at least I heard him say it. I don't know if it's his or not, but, uh, you know, he said that people don't care what you know until they know that you care, mm. right? Um, so you've got to develop that dialogue and that relationship with people. Right. And I think that's really where the first part of my three C's care, commit and change lives come from. You know, you, you, you got to develop a relationship and a dialogue so that people understand that you truly care about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'll tell you, uh, I was terrible at this when I first started. Right. Um, I, I distinctly remember, uh, a time frame when I was I was on a temporary duty assignment with with a group of guys. I was a young E6, uh, just put on E6, which is a technical sergeant in the Air Force, uh, and I had five NCOs below me, right? All staff sergeants. Um, three of those guys were older than me, uh, and they had been in longer than I had been in. Mm. Uh, so you know, you kind of had that spectrum. And then I had two young staff sergeants, right, that were just chomping at the bit to get better at what they were doing. Um, and what I tried to do was develop those, those one-on-one relationships with each of them. Mm. Uh, but what that turned into was, was me doing things for them, mm. right? And it wasn't creating a dialogue. So we weren't thinking together. It was, Hey, come to me and I'll help you. Mm. Right. But that's not always the right way to do it. So, uh, what happened is it became very ind- individualistic. So I would help one guy, but when I helped this guy, it would hurt the other one. Mm. Right. And then I would help this one and it would hurt this one. Right. So I learned a a deep lesson about uh, leadership, not being individualistic like that. It's very uh, systemic. It's very systematic. Right. Mm -hmm. What I do here affects what happens here. Right. Uh, So I had to really learn to be committed to the whole uh, and helping the individuals think together. Right. Um, So, you know, in that same temporary duty assignment, Eventually, we got all together and we sat down, and we hashed things out, and we all got on the same page. Uh, we got through the assignment, and it was it was good. But uh, but that's a an example of how we fail forward. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I came back from that assignment, and I left shortly after that. Um, but that's the time when when I really started to sit down and reflect on what type of leader I want to be. Right? Because yes, it's about taking care of people, uh, but then. How am I taking care of them? And this is really where uh, the three C's transpired, right? Okay. To this point, I hadn't really thought about developing a motto and going after it and and using that as a leadership style. 
Um, you know, and I, I've, I've tried to keep as many names out of this as I can, because there's a lot of people who are still active and, mm-hmm. uh, may even listen to this and, uh, think, man, is he talking about me? Uh, <laughs> but I will say that I have to give credit where credit is due. And, uh, one of my best friends, uh, really, he's the one that came up with this motto of three C's, mm-hmm. right? He's a very creative thinker. Uh, I'm not as much of a creative thinker as he is, but man, I'll take something and I'll run with it. For Absolutely. Sure. Um, so he and I kind of, you know, went through this and developed it together and we were supposed to take it together and kind of run with it. You know, we were in different units. Let's, Hey, you apply it here and I'll apply it here and and we'll spread it across the air force. Um, but Luke, he, he's a a tremendous leader, uh, and does some great things. Uh, so I have to give him the credit for, for coming up with it, but then he kind of stepped back and Mm. he said, look, you're, you're running with us. Take it, Mm. do it. Right. Um, so, uh, the, the part about developing leaders uh, and where does care come from and where does commit commitment come from? Those two come together when, when you talk about having other people with you, right? Mm. You've got, you can't walk alone through leadership. Um, and that's really where the commitment part came in. I, I have to be committed to this. How do I care for people? Uh, let me be committed to this. Let me develop a team mm. of folks. Um, and that was, that was Luke. And that was, uh, you know, my, my stepdad, I had to give him a lot of credit. Um, he's walked with me through my entire life. Um, and I can't really pinpoint every moment that he's, mm. he's throwing things out there and develops me, but I can look back and go, man, he was there during that moment. He was mm. there during that moment, right? Mm-hmm. He's always there to encourage me. Um, so, so that's really good. Um, <clears throat> but getting back on track, uh, during, during that reflective time, there was another book that came up. Uh, and it was called The Servant. Uh, mm. It's by by uh, James C. Hunter. Uh, and the book really taught me the concept of servant leadership, right? And 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 at the at the foundation of servant leadership, it, it really taught me that you're just working for the people who provide you the opportunity to lead them, right? Because you're you don't just go out and say, hey, I'm gonna lead you today, right? You, these people they have to turn that over to you and they have to say, mm. hey, I want to follow you. Mm. Uh, and, and what you do with that determines how they turn out, right? Which is kind of the, the last C in that. Am I going to change this person's life? Uh, probably one way or another I'm going to, mm. right? But, yeah. but the goal yeah. is to change it for the better, right? So um, so that book kind of influenced me in that way. I said, okay, it takes that pyramid, right? And uh, I'm reading through your book, so it's not your pyramid, right? <laughs> um, but, it t- but it takes that typical pyramid of the leader being at the top and the father right. being at the bottom and it freaks right. that upside down. Right. Nice. Yeah. Um, and, and it says that I'm on the bottom, right. I'm going to provide everything that I can for my, for my team to do what they need to do. Right. And then the air force, we kind of call that, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things for it, but it's organized, train and equip. Right. You know, you, you, you set an organization up for success, then you provide them what they need to, to learn and to be competent in their jobs uh, and then you equip them with whatever they need to do that, right? That's all part of that caring for them. It's all part of being committed to leading those folks. Uh, and then it's part of that that ultimate goal of changing their lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, it, when it comes to servant leadership, servant leaders are known for developing other leaders, right? Because we care that they that they develop and that they move on and that they learn and lead in the future. Uh, so one other book that popped up during that time frame, uh, it's called The Starfish and the Spider. Uh, and, and, and really, the book is more about centralized command and decentralized execution. Uh, but when you when you look at it from a servant leadership perspective, it, it gives the example of a starfish, right? And you think of a starfish as, and they're just to me, they're just lazy. They just sit there, right? I don't, I don't really know what a starfish does, um, but it's kind of the biological makeup of a starfish right so a spider you cut the leg off of a spider and what happens right it's going to walk around on seven different legs right probably with a limp and upset because they only have seven legs instead of eight now right uh but when you cut the leg off of a starfish there are certain starfishes that will that will regenerate that leg Mm. right not only will that leg regenerate but the leg that you cut off can generate into another starfish Mm. right so when you talk about servant leaders and they're their drive and, and want to develop other people. That's what you're talking about. Mm. You're talking about regenerating other leaders and developing new leaders that when they leave and they go out and, and they have their own followers, 
How are they going to develop those folks? So it's why I kind of put it under the umbrella of care, commit, and change lives. It's easy to remember, right? right I can say, hey, right. three C's, care, commit, and change lives. Uh, and I can, during the time of influence that I have in somebody's life, I can repeatedly, repeatedly use that type of uh, motto. They're going to remember it and they're going to take that and they're going to say, okay, I'm going to take care of somebody. I'm going to be committed to that and hopefully I can change their lives. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Deep Leadership is brought to you by Strike Force Energy. Strike Force Energy is a veteran-owned company founded by a Navy SEAL and their products are all made in the USA. Strike Force Energy is a liquid flavor pack that you can add into any beverage. It has zero calories, zero carbs, and zero sugar. Each pack contains 80 milligrams of caffeine. Strike Force Energy is offering a discount to all the listeners of Deep Leadership. Go to strikeforceenergy.com and enter the discount code I have the watch, one word, for a 20% discount on every order. Deep Leadership is also brought to you by my Amazon best selling book, I Have the Watch Becoming a Leader Worth Following. This book is filled with 23 short stories on how you can become a more effective leader. It's super easy to read, and most people finish it in less than two hours. Go to IHaveTheWatch.com and click the large orange button for signed copies. Enter the discount code IHaveTheWatch, one word, at checkout for 20% off your order, and domestic shipping is always free. That's really powerful, you know. And, and I, you know, I spent 22 years in corporate America after my time in the military, and um, I would tell you this: um, that is a very rare uh, trait. Uh, those traits are very rare uh, in leadership today. So, you know, one thing I've I didn't hear through you describing you know, the three C's and servant leadership is anything about yourself, anything about. Um, you know, what your rank will be or your promotions or how much money you're going to make or how much glory you're going to get. Um, you've shifted the paradigm around saying it's not about me. It's about the people. It's about the team. It's about the mission. Those are the those are the things that are most important. And, um, you know, I named my my book, which you've got now called I Have the Watch. And when we were in the Navy and you had the watch, you were responsible not only for the mission to accomplish the mission at the time, whatever it was, but you're also responsible for the people uh, as well. So you had that dual responsibility of carrying out the mission, but also taking care of the people at the same time. And I think my, from my perspective in, in corporate America, we, we don't do that. We tend to focus on the mission. Uh, in a lot of cases, many leaders just focus on themselves, right? How, what, can I, what decision can I make that's gonna be better for my career? and get me advanced to the next level, get me a bigger bonus check. And what you're talking about has nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, about, no. it's about taking care of the team. It's building the team, building new leaders, spreading that influence. Like you talked about the starfish, you know, an arm gets cut off. It, it grows another starfish. You, as, as, as you influence people in the ways of leadership, they go on to influence other people and they go on to, have careers of their own necessarily and could potentially be your boss someday. Right. Yeah, definitely. You know, and what I think is interesting and, and, you know, as, as I continue to read through your book, you, you talk about this in one of your chapters, um, but it's, it's going through and it's developing other people in a way that they're going to take care of the mission. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, taking care of the people leads to taking care of the mission. And a lot of people don't, they forget about that. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, they think that their people are, are are expendable right and they're not you you don't have a mission without the people right right? so you you have to feed them and you have to organize train and equip them in a way that they're going to take care of the mission uh you know it's not easy right we could talk about it all day and uh, every scenario is different uh and and it's it's difficult dealing with people and how do you plug them together but that's the challenge of it right that's the passion that i have and the love for doing that is trying to figure that out and in the military we move a lot Mm-hmm. Uh, I've actually been blessed to be in, in specific places for longer than usual, right? So I think I've only been at four different bases with a few different, you know, TDYs and, and deployments in between there. But uh, but a lot of people move more than that. You, mm-hmm. You'll talk to people who have been at 17 different locations in their career. And it's, right. 
it's crazy. Uh, and I think that maybe it, maybe you could speak more to this on the civilian side, but that's what's different, I think, about the military, right? Is that in two years, I, I move somewhere else, right? And I have to redevelop an entirely new team. Um, but that's the beauty of what I love to do because I get the opportunity to influence more people. It's all about the span of influence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I don't know that that necessarily happens on the civilian side, right? No, you kind no, of you get a team and yeah, you get stuck. I mean, I, I see a lot of companies, they'll pigeonhole people, you know, everybody, well, you're, you're an engineer. You can never be anything but an engineer, right? You're, you're a purchasing person. You, you don't, you don't ever do anything more than that. So we tend to pigeonhole people. Whereas, you know, the military would say, all right, you're doing this role. All right. Next, next, like, like in your career. All right. Now you're doing this role and it's something completely different. And it, as it turns out, uh, humans are amazingly adaptable and we can do many things, not just one thing, not just oh. what our degree was in necessarily. <laughs> so I think part of, um, part of the military was great is they gave you opportunities. They challenged you and they, they put you way outside your comfort zone to either accomplish a task you've never done before, or lead a team you've never led before. So you were always constantly being pushed and challenged. And I don't think we do that enough in the civilian world. We tend to, um, well, you know, that person's not ready for that job. Well, I wasn't ready for many of the jobs I did in the military, but I was just thrown into them. And, you know, you've got to learn you know, in action, why you're, why you're actually doing it, you know, and I think oh, that yeah. uh, there's not enough of that uh, in the civilian world. So, um, so I think those are, those are, those are, those actually give you those, those opportunities where you get a chance to do something you've never done before. I think you grow, you're outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And I think we have too much comfort maybe in civilian leadership today. People are comfort and in their, their roles. And that's why, by the way, there's so much stress right now in the COVID crisis because people are outside their comfort zone. And so for the first time, many civilian uh, managers, leaders are trying to lead in a way they've never had to do before and they're way outside their comfort zone. So there's a lot of stress in that. So, and it's funny because I do, I do like to look at mili you know, either veterans or military leaders through this whole crisis and they sort of have a little bit of a smile on their face and they're like, okay, yeah, it's bad, but it's not as bad as, basic training or whatever, you know, they, they kind of yeah. look back at a time in their lives that, well, this isn't that bad. So, you know, but, yeah. And uh, it's, you know, it, it, the stress level is there, uh, but mm -hmm. it's, I think you learn throughout the years that uh, it's being comfortable in the uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? You, yeah. you mentioned yeah. that we're always in an uncomfortable situation. And as soon as you start getting comfortable, um, you're asked to move somewhere else and become uncomfortable again. So yeah, um, yeah, there's a constant pull. They're constantly making you uncomfortable and then you get comfortable and then they'll pull you again. <laughs> and yeah, you're, you're right. I think, and that's probably why you grow faster. Or you you learn more is because you're always, you know, they say growth comes when you're outside your comfort zone. And it seemed like, it seems like the military is their experts at taking you out of your comfort zone <laughs> and putting <laughs> you in true. situations yeah. that, wait a second, <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do here? You know, so, well, very good. Um, so we touched upon um, some of the difference between military and, and um, civilian leadership, but uh, what would you say, you know, in your opinion, what are some great characteristics? Uh, what are some characteristics of a great leader? Uh, so <laughs> sticking with my three C's, I'll, I'll tell you the first okay. one is they've got to be caring, right? And, and that's something that's a, a learned skill. Right. You can say that you care about somebody, but how, how is that applicable? Right. How do you apply that? How do you show caring? Um, but I think that that's a, that's a key characteristic, right? If leaders don't care about their people, then they're going to treat them as if they're expendable. Right. And, and they're, they're going to lose their folks and they're going to lose focus on the mission because they can't care for their folks. I was going um, to stop you right there, Ron, because I think that's a really important point is that you just said that caring is a learned skill. And I, I really want to emphasize that because I'll, I'll give you an example of myself. <clears throat> I'm an engineer, a technical person, right? So I came up through technical ranks. Um, caring isn't something that's in my DNA, right? <clears throat> I'm a, I, you know, very technical, let's fix it. Let's, you know, problem, you know, solve this problem, move on type of thing, right? Uh, but <clears throat> you can become a caring manager, but you may have to force it a little bit in yourself. So I would just give you an example. I have a spreadsheet on my computer, on, on my desktop, where I have everybody's birthday, all their children's names, their spouse's names. So I know, and I have all, when their birthdays come up on my calendar, I know, and if something's going on in their lives, I make sure to put it on the spreadsheet. So it's a little bit mechanical. 
However, it helps me to become more caring, to be more focused, uh, to, to ask the right questions. How's your son doing? How's your wife doing? You know, and, and knowing more about their lives. So in a way, it's maybe people say, well, that's not genuine, but, but it really is. I want to be a better caring manager, but sometimes you have to learn that skill versus if you don't have it in your DNA to begin with. So I, I just wanted to, you know, make that point. So not yeah, to no, that's too a, much, but no, that's a great point. And, you know, one of the things that I think helps learn uh, or develop that type of characteristic is, is learning personalities, mm. right? You, you, you develop a, some type of systematic way to learn personalities, right? For, for us, it was, uh, I can't remember the, the exact title of it. There's a personality test. It's the four different colors, four lenses, I think is, mm-hmm. is what it was called. Um, but you know, it, it talks about different personalities, right? If you're, you're blue, you're, you're really caring, right? You're going to, so your feelings get hurt a lot easier. So if I know that about my individual and I know if they, they mess up, I have to be very careful on how I discuss that with them. I can't mm. just jump out the box and yell at them because I'm going to completely lose them. Uh, and that, that sphere of influence is gone. Right. And then you have other folks who are green and they're very systematic. They're very technical. So I can speak to them in using uh, Air Force instructions and references and they're mm-hmm. going to go, oh, OK, mm-hmm. now it now it makes sense. Right. Right. And then you have the orange folks who are just very they're just crazy. Right. Mm-hmm. They're 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 the guys who are going skydiving on the weekends. Right. <laughs> um, those are the ones that you can jump in and you got to do it quick. Right. Because their their attention spans are smaller, mm-hmm. uh, but they're the most creative people. Right. So those are the ones you lean on for ideas. Mm. So it's just understanding those different characteristics of folks and their personalities. And I think that's really how you can show that you care because you're, you're speaking to them in their language. Mm, yeah. Right? It's not a cookie cutter uh, mm. approach to leadership. You have to lead to each individual's strengths, weaknesses, and how they're, how they're led. So, sorry, I took you off track, but uh, caring is the, the first one. We were talking about characteristics. Yeah, right yeah. There. So caring um, one, but I, I really, wa- I think that's important, you know, those who are listening is that if you don't necessarily, necessarily have a caring personality, you can develop one. So when you said learn yeah. skill, I really want to touch on that. So if you do not have that, you can build that. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. And then I would say probably the next one would be that the leaders just have to be bold, mm. right? So sometimes you're not going to have all the information that you need to make mm. a decision, right? So, so, so you have to be able to take the information that you have uh, and make that decision in a timely manner, right? Some of them, you know, I've never been on the front lines of combat, um, but I can tell you that they're, that they, they spend years and years and years training for that. And they know when they get into the field of battle, right? That when, when whoever is in charge of that says, Hey, move, it's time to move. Mm. Right. And those decisions can be made quickly, but there are some decisions that, that you're, you're not, ha- you don't have all the information. You don't have time to, to develop the information. You just got to make the decision on, on what you're doing and bold leadership to me, uh, or, or characteristic of being bold is understanding that sometimes you're going to make a decision and you may fail at it. Mm. Right. Uh, and it's okay to fail at it. Uh, as long as you can lay your head down at night and go, I, I, thought about everything that I could think about. And I made the, deci- the best decision possible with the information that I had. That's being bold. So I, I think that that's a, a strong characteristic in, in leaders. So taking care of folks, caring, and then just being bold. I think it's great. I think it's really important because one thing that people don't like is a, wishy- a wishy-washy leader that's not making decisions. <laughs> so be decisive. I had my first CEO out of the military. Uh, he said, um, he said, um, what, he said, when you make a mistake, it's not going to get you fired. If if you make the right decision, it's not going to get you fired. If you make the wrong decision, it's not going to get you fired. What's going to get you fired is not making the decision. He said, make, be decisive and fix it along the way. So make the decision, move forward. And then if you have to self-correct, if you have to adjust the, the goal, if you have to move, then do it. But keep making those decisions. Keep being decisive. Make sure the people know where you're headed. It's nothing worse than everybody just standing around waiting for a leader to make a decision. Like, which way do we go? What, what do we, where do we go? And I've seen leaders do that for years. They won't make a decision on, a, on an important subject. And, and everybody sort of, and it actually creates conflict in the team as people don't know what direction to head. So they're, they say, well, I think we should go this way. I think we should go this way. Well, I, I think we should wait for the boss to make the call, you know? And so it, it creates tension in the organization when there's no, 
when a leader isn't decisive. So being bold, I think, is really important. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great advice, too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So um, so what's, what's your future plans now? So you're working uh, on your PhD uh, and you're uh, your first lieutenant and you're 17 years in. What's, what's your plans for the military and beyond for you? You know, a lot of people ask me that, uh, <laughs> and, and I haven't been able to pinpoint an answer. Um, I can tell you that uh, simply, I just want to influence people. So, mm. uh, if that is if that is continued progression in the military, then by all means, I'm I'm there. As long as the Air Force lets me keep taking care of people, I'm here. Mm. Um, that you know, if if I had to speak in terms of you know what my plans are in the Air Force, um, I've always wanted to command. Mm. So it, it's, it's been my passion since the beginning, you know, when we talked about wanting to commission, I want to commission to, to grow my span of influence. Um, and I've worked with some really great commanders, uh, and I, I would love to do that. Uh, mm. I really just want, want to be in that. Now, I understand, um, you know, not firsthand knowledge of it, but sitting back and working with commanders, you know, right now I work directly for the commander. Uh, mm. And then my past job, again, directly for the commander. So I've had the opportunity to sit behind closed doors and, and see uh, how they they deal with things and the process of thinking through decisions that they make. Uh, and it's tough. It's a tough mm. job. Mm. Um, but that's what I want to do because they get the opportunity to take care of people. Uh, the, the influence that they have on, on individuals' lives uh, is, is vast. And that's, mm. that's what I want to do. Um, so whether it's a, a squadron, a group, a wing, um, doesn't matter. I just would love to be in that position. But if I never get afforded that opportunity, um, that's okay because I'll, I'll influence the folks that are with me right now uh, and, and whoever I have the opportunity to lead in the future. So uh, the bottom line is that I would love to command. Um, however long that takes me, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that – so uh, prior enlisted officers, they cross over. They call us Mustangs. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't really know where that comes from. I just know it's a term that's out there. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the oldest Mustangs in the Air Force is uh, uh, Lieutenant General Highholt, the three-star. I'm not sure where he's at now, but I had the opportunity to work for him uh, in the past. And you're talking about 45-plus years of service. Mm, wow. um, so so I don't know if that's the plans for me in the future. Uh, if the Air Force lets me continue to take people, you know, take care of people for the next 30 years, I'm here. Um, so... As far as where I go after that, I, I don't know. Uh, I'll just go with the flow and continue to lead <laughs> people. So if that's, uh, if that's working in corporate America, great. If it's, you know, coaching high school football, great. If it's, you know, enjoying retirement with my wife, great. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So your answer to the question is the exact same answer I was given. I was giving people when they were asking me what I was doing when I was getting out of the military. I didn't know. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's really good. And so, uh, yeah. And, and, and in my case, I continued to do what I was doing in the military, which was leading and influencing people. And it just, uh, you know, on a bigger and bigger scale and eventually on my own company. And, and, uh, and so, but um, yeah, so your, your future is what you, what you want it to be. And uh, I think as long as you're making a deep impact on people's lives and you're making a difference, I think there's, there's going to be tremendous opportunity for you both in the Air Force and, and outside. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll keep, we'll keep rolling with it and bloom where we're planted, as they say. Exactly. Exactly. Well, very good, uh, Ron. This was really a good discussion and leaders that are listening in and, and hopefully you were taking notes. If, well, if you're not driving, of course, but hopefully you took some notes and there's some great stuff here. And I really liked um, a lot of what uh, Ron said about leadership, uh, not being about the leader and uh, taking care of people and, and uh, you know, his three C's of care, commit and change lives. These are really important. And uh, it's, it's about, it's about others when you're in leadership position, you know, when you're promoted in that role and you have people working for you, it's no longer about you. It's about them. And um, you still have a mission to accomplish, but you also have to do it in the right way. And um, I really like the discussion we had about um, developing to be becoming uh, more of a caring person and knowing that's a learned skill. So if you have to figure out a way to do it, and even if it's mechanical in the beginning, like in my case, do it because it, it you're, it'll, it'll reap uh, rewards later on. So be, so, you know, no one's going to know that you have a spreadsheet on your computer 
that tells them what their birthday is. But uh, if you thank, if you wish them happy birthday, they're going to be happy, right? So it'll be a nice thing. And so, and I liked um, what Ron said about being bold and make decisions and not being indecisive. So really important, especially in the fog of war, right, where we don't necessarily have all the all the information, but we do have to make a decision. We got to move forward and we got to align the troops to the right direction. So very important uh, as uh, you know, thought on that subject as well. So. So that's uh, that's it. So thank you very much, Ron. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, John, I appreciate you having me out. So. Okay, great. Well, that's it for today. So thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Reddy saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care.